Thursday night worship service. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. If you would, we're going to sing a little bit. We're going to sing as we gather. It might be virtually, but we're gathering together anyways. Um, where two or three are gathered together in my name, they're in my midst of them. So we're going to stand here, more than two or three, and we're going to sing and praise the Lord. So as we gather, may your spirit work with us. Let's sing. chapter 16 and verse 26 if you remember and watched with us for Sunday school we went over this Matthew 16 and verse 26 there it is behold the fowls uh, oh that's the wrong verse I have there for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul hopefully hopefully you already memorize this verse but if not, here's your chance to memorize it. Let's say it all as a group together. Matthew 16, 16 26. verse 26. For, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Well, let's sing our last song for the day. May the peoples praise you.
you're singing with us. And Pastor, would you come ahead and give All us right. the word for tonight? Thank All you. All right. Excellent, excellent. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you for joining us here this evening. I hope you're having a, a good week, uh, even though yes. we're going through uh, uh, some coronavirus-type things, and, and hopefully God is, is working in your heart and in your life. I want to present to you a little bit of a challenge. I want you to take the acronym Cronola, uh, uh, Cronola, Cronola, not Cronola, Cronola, <laughs> uh, coronavirus, and I want you to create some sort of um, some sort of help uh, for other people, and um, make sure that uh, make sure that uh, we are focusing on the right thing. We have a little bit of focus problems there, but. Uh, uh, it's important that during this time of I isolation, during this time that we stay focused, we stay uh, productive, and that God is using us in a great way. So take those words, uh, Corona, and um, uh, those letters, and try to make a, a cool little acronym. Put it in the um, put it in the in the response line there, and don't get too distracted from your message. It from the message tonight. If you have your Bible, go to John chapter 12. And this is our Bible reading for today. Remember, we're going through a chapter every day. And that chapter is either found in our Bible reading calendar or in, um, in our app, the Graceway app. So you can look up Graceway DC at uh, Google Play or at the Apple App Store. And you can download our app. It's got the, uh, the chapters for the day. We have Old Testament. We have New Testament. Uh, but every Thursday night, we try to focus on uh, the chapter, the New Testament chapter of the week. And sometimes uh, we do something else, and that's fine. That's great. Uh, you know, if God gives us direction, if God's given us inspiration, man, we want that. We want that. I want it. I know you do as well. Well, I want to take the, the, first, the first story, really, presented in John chapter 12, and I'd like to bring it to us, and I'd like us to comment as we go. So an open dialogue here, and I moved the fam from uh, from the back uh, to the front, or from the front to the back or something, but uh, they're the choir, so um, uh, do you like it? Thumbs up if you like it. You can't give a thumbs down, so guys, you're good. You're, you're good, all right? So we want to... Um, we want to engage just as much as is possible during this time of isolation. In John chapter 12, and I want to read the first few verses there, 1 through 11. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There he made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the temple table with him. Now, just before we go on any further, Bethany is just a little ways out from Jerusalem, just uh, about uh, three to six miles. As a matter of fact, my wife and I were, uh, we just did a little, little Google, uh, little Google something, a maps, Google maps, and uh, uh, we, we checked the traffic is light right now, yep. and uh, the freeway going across there is, like six miles. Six miles by freeway, three something if, three you, if you walk Walk the trail. So yeah. th these are real places still in yes. existence today. And, and Jesus often resorted uh, out, out to this place, Bethany, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to rest and to eat and to be with his friends here, uh, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. These three are just really key people uh, in this story and in the story of Christ. And by the way, there's four other kind of key people here. There's Judas, bad guy music there. There's the poor. Now the poor are mentioned twice. They're not actually in the story, but Judas mentions them, and then Jesus mentions them. There's the chief priests, and then there's believers. So we don't really see the, the poor, and we don't see the believers, but they're spoken of, and it's pretty cool. Now here's the, the center of the story. Here's the action part. Verse number three, then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. 
Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for three hundred pence and given to the poor? And this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he held the bag and bear what was put therein. We're in verse number seven. If you're just joining us, John chapter 12, and we're reading through verse 11. Verse seven, then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my burying hath she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there. This is the kind of conspiracy here against Lazarus. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. Verse 10. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. Well, that's our text, verses 1 through 11. Hopefully you read along with me and did the, did the screen work the whole way? The screen worked the whole way, which is good, because earlier it was not working so good, and certain technical people were a little bit frustrated. Not that we would name anybody at all. <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and, and ask God for his blessing. Father, we sure do love you. We ask that you would bless us and help us. I pray that your word would be, would be exalted and lifted up. And Lord that we would receive your truth and we'd be different because we've met together. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, this is a, an incredible story. It's in all four Gospels. And I've preached uh, similar messages to this many different times. And I think it's in all four Gospels because it is so practical. It, it's right where we live. It's the scene is in a home, just like your home. So don't try to think of some, you know, Middle Eastern home, which obviously it was. Uh, Bethany, just three miles kind of southeast of, uh, of Jerusalem. And not necessarily think of that. Think of your home. Think of where you live, where you sit, where you cook, and, and where you entertain guests, and all these sort of things. That is what's going, going on. And if we could, we could take some incredible truths here, and I want to ask you this question. In this story, what part would you play? That is, if you're an actor and um, you, are, you are becoming part of this character, this character sketch, part of this drama. Now, it's true. I'm not saying it's not true. It's true. But what part would you be? Would you be Mary? She's the worshiper. Would you be Martha? She's the worker. Would you be Lazarus? He's, man, everybody's coming to see. He's, he's there at the table with the Lord and he's convincing many people to come to Jesus. He's got this amazing testimony. Would you be Judas? Would you, would you be pointing people to uh, some distractive measure that you would have so that you could take advantage of the situation? Would you be the chief priest, kind of accusing and kind of wearing the, the holy robes of authority? Or uh, would you be these other believers that are, that are going to believe because of this great testimony? Look at verse number 11, and this is kind of the interaction I would like to give. Because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. That is, there were people that were converted to Christ because of this man's testimony. What was his testimony? That he that was dead is now alive. Now we can spiritualize this kind of to ourselves because, uh, you know, I haven't died physically and I'm not raised from the dead, but I should have a testimony that I am not the same person that I was. You should have that testimony that I'm different, I'm alive. You know, Christians oftentimes have this testimony somehow that they're dead, that they're subdued, that they're not as alive as the world. I think that's crazy. 
I think the Christian community should be the most vivacious, most um, unstoppable, most uh, influential force in any given community. And, and here's Lazarus. You can't, you can't hide the fact of his testimony. He's got true life. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the life. Are you guys talking and communicating back here? <laughs> All right, okay. Okay, good. What do you guys think? Thumbs up for, uh, for the choir here, the silent choir? Okay. <laughs> so John chapter 12 and verse number 11, because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. I wonder at the end of this um, uh, big coronavirus uh, epidemic, pandemic, uh, isolation, quarantine, I wonder what influence and what effect you and I will have had as we are, you know, setting up screens in our house and sitting awkwardly behind cameras, <laughs> in front of cameras. Uh, who is going to know? Who is going to believe? Who's going to come to Christ because of what she did? Now, by way of cross-reference, let me show you Mark chapter 14 and verse number 8. By the way, this is in all four Gospels. In Mark chapter 14 and verse number 8, uh, the Bible gives the same story, but slightly different words, and it really comes out. She hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the bearing. And, and that's another great title. I've preached that title. I want to present it to you tonight. And, and I'm not really trying to preach a message, but really kind of stir up some interaction here with you. She did what she could. Mm-hmm. Now, let me set this up a little bit. Here's um, Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and and they three are entertaining Jesus, and all these people are coming to this great dinner, and that's that's found um, in verse number one. By the way, they're getting ready for Passover, which is next week. So we'll be uh, celebrating our our Seder service and and uh, the the Passover, and actually Jesus was uh, the preparation of the Passover because he gave himself as the Lamb of God. Uh, that goes back to. Um, Abraham saying God will provide himself a lamb. And uh, God did provide himself. And John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. But she did what she could. Now look at verse number one. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead whom he raised from the dead. Man, what a testimony. And there they made him a supper, and Martha served. And Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. So first we're introduced to Martha and Mary. And I just, you know, I don't know this. I don't know this, but I'm thinking. I wonder if Martha just really had some incredible skills serving people. And I wonder if Lazarus had some some great communication skills, entertaining people, sitting at the table, saying, so what were you doing? Like for four days, what was it like? And he's saying this, that, the other thing. And, and Martha, she's she's cooking and preparing guests, and she's making sure everybody's seated and, every, and all the proper uh, etiqu- etiquette is being taken care of. And, and here's Martha, and she's just getting busy. You know, in any given home, there's somebody that plays those roles. Here's Lazarus. He's sitting, kind of talking. And here's Martha. She is working. And she's making sure the guests have the the right everything. And then there's Mary. And Mary's sitting at the feet of Jesus and looks like she's doing nothing. But she's doing something big. She's doing something eternal. Let me say this. Let me get up right close and personal with you. Let me say, um, sometimes the most important thing, sometimes the most important thing that you can do is going to be overlooked by the community. I think that's going on in this whole pandemic in the world. Those that are getting the front lines and the headlines and all the glamour and all the money and, and all the prestige and probably aren't doing that much. Those that are behind the scenes focusing on the eternal and worship, which this is a picture of worship, might be doing the most good. 
She hath done what she could. Hmm. Now, let's look what she did. Verse number three. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Here is the center of the situation. It's a home situation. It's uh, entertaining guests. People are working. People are hustling. People are feeling pressure. And one of the hosts or hostesses is apparently doing nothing, but then comes out with this alabaster box. We know it's an alabaster box from another portion. And she breaks it and pours it out and on his head and it runs down and then on his feet as this passage shows and then she ends up wiping his feet with her, with her hair. And the odor fills the whole room and it can't be hidden. And it, her gift then starts to overshadow Lazarus who's talking at the table and her gift overshadows Martha, who's working and hustling and preparing, and, and that act of worship comes forward. Deborah, tell us a little bit about um, the spikenard. Come, come right up here. Tell us a, real quick about that. Well, spikenard is also called nard or nardin or muskroot. I kind of like spikenard myself. Is a class, and it is a class of aromatic amber-colored essential oil mm -hmm. um, derived from a, a Narda Statius Jadamansi, which I don't know. All of you botanists out there, help me. A flowering plant of the Valerian family. We know Valerian that helps relieve pain, um, which grows in the Himalayas of Nepal, China, and India. Mm -hmm. So it grows to about one meter or three feet in height, and it has a pink bell-shaped flower. It's found at an altitude about 3,000 to 5,000 meters, which is 9,800 9, to 16,400 feet. So this is a high altitude plant. Um, it has underground stems and it can be crushed and distilled into an intensely aromatic amber colored, as I already said, essential oil with a thick consistency. Those of you who are into oils, Vicky, um, I'm sure you do have some spike nerd. I don't know. Um, yeah. It is used as a perfume, as an incense, and as an herbal medicine. So the oil was known in ancient times, and it was part of an oil or herbal, excuse me, tradition in India. It was obtained as a luxury in ancient Egypt, um, the Near East, and the, the Egyptians stored the oil in alabaster cases to preserve its fragrance. Um, I also read that alabaster is a mineral or rock that is soft, often used for carving, and is processed for plaster powder. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting. Excellent. Any questions there? We'll Google move it. on. We'll yeah. move on. <laughs> you got to be quick on the keyboard there if you want your questions uh, brought in. Uh, let me let me also say, uh, boy, our the stats are just way up on uh, the live stream. It's unbelievable. Like. Crazy, and uh, uh, North Carolina is really coming through. So, uh, it, hey, give a cheer out for North Carolina. Yeah. Doing a great job. Uh, also, if you go to the Facebook Live there and you copy that URL, and then uh, once it's copied, you can you can text message it or email it to somebody else where they can find it. People sometimes have a hard time finding us, but uh, do what you can. Do what you can. So, she did what she could do, and she, I don't know, she didn't cook, uh, she didn't entertain, and it almost seems that she is kind of oblivious to the situation. Here, Jesus is saying, uh, let her alone, she's done what she could. Uh, don't be getting on her case, uh, and I... A lot is left to my imagination, our imagination, and I kind of see Mary here worshiping Jesus and falling down at his feet and doing things that are uncustomary. Her hair is uncovered and she's washing his feet. And this is, a, this is, this is way outside of her little jurisdiction, but she's doing it. And Jesus says, leave her alone. She's doing what she can do. And so the question is, what are you doing? I want you to think of a few people with me. I want you to think of Moses. Moses started doing some things, but they weren't exactly what God wanted him to do. And he physically lashed out. 
and he was kicked out of Egypt and he, he was stripped of his position. He, was, uh, he lost his possessions, he, his power, his very privilege of the prince of Egypt, he lost it all. And then, and then years and decades later, God meets him in the desert and says, what's in your hand? And that's what God asks each of us to do. God asks us to give and to do something that we have. God doesn't ask us what we don't have. He says, what's in your hand? And then he says, throw it down. Now, this is, this is huge. What, is, what do you have? And then are you willing to throw it down or throw it away or cast it from you? That's what Moses did. He, he threw it down. And then it turned into a serpent. And then God said, pick it up. Throw it down and then pick it up. It sounded like ministry. <laughs> it sounded like ministry, right. Throw it down, pick it back up. And uh, from this point, the rod of Moses becomes the rod of God. And something had to get out of that rod. Maybe we could say a snake, a serpent had to get out of that rod. I think that's true with a lot of our talents. We have something, but until we're willing to throw it down, God can't use it. And it will always be ours. I want to ask you and I want to encourage you tonight, today, whenever you're watching this, I want to encourage you right now to surrender right where you're at. God, here is what I have and I'm throwing it down in a sense so that I might be able to pick it up and have it be yours. That is the secret. As long as it's ours, God can't get the glory. And so when he took that serpent out of it, so to speak, that gift was purged. With Moses, his gift had to be purged. I think that's true with me and you. It's got to be purged. I want you to think of David. David was left behind. David was left behind when it came to anointing kings. David was left behind when it came to go to war. He was the boy left behind. And daddy says, hey, why don't you take some bread and cheese to your brothers? And so he's, he's going to the battlefield, and I'm sure he struggled a little bit with the feeling of just being the left behind kid or something like that. And, and then somehow... He's brought into the king's tent and he gets the king's armor. But that wasn't good enough. He said, it's not proven. I can't take this. And so he took the thing that was proven. And while he was out in those fields, forsaken and forgotten, he took what was proven, that is his sling and the stones, and he picked up those five stones and he went and met the enemy of God and he defeated him. So Moses shows us that our gifts that we have have to be purged, but David shows us that the gifts that we have have to be proven. That's good. Now, I want you to think about uh, the, the young lad with his lunch, and we just talked about that recently, and the feeding of the 5,000. He had the five loaves and the two fishes, and he was out in the desert with a hungry crowd. He was probably hungry himself. He was probably weak. He was probably waiting for an opportunity to eat his lunch. It's way past lunch, but he knows that if he tries to eat his lunch, somebody might just take it from him. But then the disciples come and uh, that lunch or that gift, we're talking about she hath done what she could. You still with me? Everybody with me? Yes. It had to, number three, it had to be presented. And my friends, your gifts have to be presented before God. And then God blesses them and breaks them and passes them out. And people have as much as they can. And then there's leftovers. One more little thought there on what we have. I and mean, she did what she could. Why don't you think about Elisha? Elisha and the widow in the desert in the time of famine. And he comes and says, bring what you have in the house. And she says, I don't have anything but this oil, just a pot of oil. And she says, bring it. And she brings it, she goes, gets it, that little flask of oil and brings it. And then God asks her to pour it out. And so that's the fourth little thing. So Moses show, shows us that our, our gifts and what we present, what we can do have to be purged. David showed us 
then it had to be proven. The lad with the lunch had had to be presented. And, and then Elisha came, and with that widow woman, it had to be poured out. I want to tell you that God never asks us for what we don't have. And God's not asking you for what you don't have. But God always asks us for something that he's already given us that often we overlook and we think, well, everybody's got this. And the truth is, maybe so and maybe not. But God asks us to do what we can. And this woman here in John chapter 12, she did what she could. Now maybe uh, Martha had a, an alabaster box of this, this wonderful essential oil. She might have had it, but she didn't pour it out. She was doing something else. I really think she was doing what she could too. But her gift was prominent. And uh, Martha's, uh, Mary's was prominent later. As a matter of fact, much more prominent. Uh, but it came about later. The Bible says, unto whom much is given, much shall be required. Much is required. So those that are given much, a lot is required. Now I want you to think about that. We, we think the same way. If, uh, you know, somebody that is an incredible athlete, uh, they get out there and they throw the ball or can't make a great catch or hit or uh, whatever it is, boy, we go, man, that's awesome. But if, if somebody that is just, you know, a kindergartner or maybe possibly hand, handicapped or something like that, and they don't do so well, we don't go, ah, that's unacceptable. No, you see somebody's effort, you see somebody present what they have, it's a wonderful thing. It's a beautiful thing, and we all love it. We applaud it. We, it's wonderful. So each one of us has to be doing what we can. She did what she could. So let me ask you, are you doing what you can do? Right now, in the midst of all the chaos, are you doing what you can do? You should be. God wants you to, and that's why God has loaned these things to you that you have. Realize this, nobody has things forever, and nobody really owns them. We're just borrowing them, we're using them, we're stewarding them for a short time. I can remember my mother singing, I wonder have I done my best for Jesus. And she would play that at the piano, and she would, uh, I think it was a Kim Cade piano with, made out of red oak, and she would polish it. Oh, she loved that piano. And she'd play that piano, and she'd sing, I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus? And I, I wonder, have I done my best? And I want to ask you, have you done your best for Jesus? One more quick thought. Not only did she do what she could, she did it when she could. See, this is just right before Passover. As a matter of fact, then Jesus, six days before the Passover. And this is the whole Passover feast. So here's the Lord, and he's about to die, and somehow the disciples and the other people don't quite get it. Now, he's announced it, he's told them, but they don't quite get it. But Mary does. She did it when she could. Now here's Judas, just, we digress, just for a second, here's Judas, and he's kind of the greedy treasurer, and he's like, hey, this is like a year's salary, what are we doing, we're pouring it, this is too much, this is like a whole bottle of essential oil, pouring all over, all over the floor, I'm sure it's all over her, it's probably on some other people, and the, the perfume, the, the fragrance of this is filling the whole room, the whole place, and probably... Probably a little bit is good and a lot might have been too much. People are going to like, wow, what is going on here? <laughs> and um, here's, there. It's, it's, a, it's a tense situation. And, and Judas is saying, these gifts should have been presented to me and then I could distribute, and he says right there, to the poor. And I think during this pandemic, a lot of us are saying, what can we do? 
What can we do for the poor? What can we do to uh, help with the mask situation, with the glove situation? And, and I saw several headlines today about, you know, somebody was hoarding and this other group was doing this. And, and then somebody else stood up and explained, no, no, nobody's hoarding anything. We're driving them straight to the hospital. And, and other people are, they're, hey, everybody's chipping in. And the real question is not, hey, what are you doing? What are you doing? The real question is, what am I doing? Yeah. What am I doing? That's what this text is. What am I doing? And Judas is the finger pointer. And he's just accusing everybody. And here's Martha. She's doing what she can do. And Lazarus, he's doing his thing. And Mary, it doesn't look like she's doing much. But all of a sudden, her gift comes to the, to the forefront. And Judas, he's just the bad guy. He's greedy. He's accusing everybody else and analyzing anybody, everybody else's gift. But I want to tell you this. I would rather have Mary in charge of distributing to the poor rather than Judas yeah. any day. How about you? What do you think? Mary or Judas? What do you want? Do you want Who do you want in charge? Now, of Mary. course they trusted. Mary. <laughs> That's right. Of course they trusted Judas. He's got the bag. He's got the position. He's got the authority. He's the one guy that's from Jerusalem. Everybody else is, you know, from the sea and fishermen and all this sort of stuff. Wow. I want you to go over to Luke chapter 10. We're almost done, almost done. Stay with me. Luke chapter number 10. And I'll give you a, a chance to ask some questions and such like. Uh, Luke chapter 10, look at verse number 41. Luke 10, verse number 41. This is the end of the same story, but each of the Gospels presents things just slightly different, and they're wonderful. Here it is. 41, and Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, Thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. So well, there was something that was needful, and Mary chose the needful thing. You know what was needful? <laughs> it wasn't just uh, a few days later. Resurrection morning. Up from the grave he arose. But there's a band of women that are going to the garden, and they've got spices and oils and ointments, and they're concerned because nobody has anointed the body of Jesus. They just off the cross, and because of the Passover, into the grave, and he, he was not anointed, but he sure was. Yeah. That was the needful thing. Mm -hmm. And Mary saw the needful thing, and maybe God, certainly God revealed it to her, and I want to say, sometimes God will give you some sort of a, a burden, uh, a vision of what needs to be done. And when God gives that to you, follow it. Yeah. And do what you can. And watch out for playing the Judas and accusing everybody else. Now, certainly there needs to be checks and balances. I'm not saying there shouldn't be any checks and balances. And Judas was guilty himself. But he was the... The guilty one was accusing the righteous one here. And that room was filled with fragrance that, that wonderful evening. And you know what? It's still filled today. And Jesus made the great prophecy that wherever uh, this gospel would be preached, her story would go. And uh, they would come on up, let's play a a little bit on the piano. Her story would go. And this room is filled with the fragrance of her sacrifice and what she poured out. I wonder, I wonder about you. I, I wonder about me. I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus? I wonder, are we doing what we can? She did what she could when she could. You know, we don't know how long we have. We have no guarantee. But I'll tell you this. God wants to use you. God wants to use me. But we're going to have to give. Father, we ask that you would move in our hearts. And Father, take this message. And Lord, I pray that we could be different. That we would not play the Judas of wanting somebody's gift to go to a certain place. Nor would we play the Pharisee trying to get power and prestige for ourselves. But we would be like Lazarus, a 
around the table pointing people to Jesus, evidencing new life, we'd be like Martha, doing what uh, the physical things that need to be done, and we would be like Mary, doing something eternal for your glory and for your honor. Father, we love you. We thank you for saving us. Lord, I want to say thank you for changing my life. Lord, I pray that I could give my best and I could give my all. And I wouldn't be afraid of having my gift purified. And I wouldn't be afraid of having my gift purified and purged of the uncleanliness in it. And I would present it to you and be willing for it to be poured out and even prove it. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your word and for your truth and thank you for Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to encourage you to make just a comment about what God spoke to you about. Now, I'm not talking about some commitment, but if God moved you, that's, that's wonderful. We're looking to be moved. We're, we're looking for that life that only God, only God can give. Wonderful. Thank you for joining us. Uh, is there any questions or comments that we need to um, address or identify right now before we wrap it up? Thank you for watching and joining us. It's awesome. I'd like to just... I'd like to mention some people who need prayer. Um, I know the Boyle family has experienced um, a, a first death from COVID-19 in their extended family, and others are sick, and we just want to pray for them tonight. Yeah. Um, also, uh, Pam and Lionel, we're praying for you. Yeah. And of course, all of us have friends and neighbors that we're concerned about. Um, I think our memory verses right on target. What should, men, what should you give in ex exchange for your soul? And then right now so many things are kind of taken away from us and I think it's it's so good for us to spend this time you know, praying for our friends and neighbors. I, I've talked to several people this week, um, FaceTimed and, and talked with them and they mentioned having more time to pray and really having a burden to pray um, Christians. So I think as you as you mentioned tonight that's something we can do I know we wanted to help a lot of people and that hasn't come to fruition where we can get out and be a Martha so it's we had several be plans we had yes. grocery plans and encouragement plans we were going to deliver packages and yes now our governor is saying stay home yeah. and so we're saying we will we will we're going to do what we can I want to encourage you to call people, text them. You never know what God can use. God can do great things. It's amazing things. Let's sing. Let's sing a little bit. I want to say, uh, listen guys, uh, wherever you're at, God inhabits the praises of his people. I want you to praise God. I want you to uh, lift up your voice and and allow God to use you in a, in a great way. Text your friends and realize that God doesn't ask for what we don't have. God always asks, always asks for what he's already given us. And he's given it to us to give away. What are we going to give?
yeah, let's sing um, As We Gather. How about that? Just a nice chorus to finish it off. service is Sunday morning. Sunday school starts at 10 o'clock and then our main service, worship service at 11 o'clock. Hope to see you there. Have a great evening.